Sports! This is Keenan Fry, and you're watching the Aspen Draft. All right, so uh, now that I've fogged the lens up, let's get up to this uh, art update. So what you're looking at is my art monster piece. So I got all my paints. These are all my Winsor Newtons over here that you just saw and so forth. And I got my bucket of brushes. And I have my super fancy Kalinsky table brush. Let's get it going. Thank you. Yeah, real authentic animal hair. Go ahead and hate me, PETA, but I don't care. I butcher animals for their fur. Well, actually, I butcher them for their hair. I don't actually butcher them. We just shave their hair and feed them and let them live in a wonderfully enclosed and well-kept environment. And then every couple of weeks, we shave their hair and use it to make sunglasses. But it's still a form of animal abuse, somehow. So uh, I want to direct your attention, though, first to my um, palette right here. So I want to start off by saying that I am using a sap green, Winsor Newton sap green, uh, yellow ochre, and I am using... Uh, cadmium red. I have a teeny tiny bit of cadmium yellow hue, and <coughs> excuse me, um, Prussian or not Prussian blue. That's the wrong one. Excuse me. Um, cerulean blue hue. So I have basically limited my palette to these colors. Uh, I have a true yellow, a true red, and a true blue a green and off yellow, and I obviously will have to add black. Uh, I will be using ivory black. I have yet to add black. Um, I am really, really trying to stick to a limited palette. If I make any tertiary colors, these being like my two, my two main layers of color, my, my primary colors here, my secondary colors here, tertiary will be anything that I mix using these colors. And then I'm not adding black to anything. If I want to darken something, I'm going to add blue to it. If I want to lighten something, I'm going to add yellow to it. If I want to intensify something, I might mix like some red and yellow in terms of like warming up the intensity. If I want to cool off the intensity but still keep it a really rich, saturated color, I will add red and blue. Now, the difference between adding red and blue versus adding purple is that you mix one in and then you mix the other in. And it kind of distributes more evenly. Um, if you mix, I mean, if you mix purple out of red and blue and then, let's say, add like a teeny bit of purple to this green, you're going to brown it up. But what you can do is if you mix the red in with the green because you want to change the color a little bit or you want to, add like yellow to it instead you can if you mix the colors one at a time in as you're trying to saturate one of these two secondary colors these two secondary colors here as you try and saturate these let me let me try and adjust this for the camera if you try and saturate these secondary colors by adding one at a time to them you will uh you'll have better control it's better to add one of these primary colors to these secondary colors if you're trying to saturate and that's just kind of like good good artistic principles you know it, you can't go wrong that way um i really love this blue like this is like this is such a fun light bright full transparent blue it's just so much fun to play with this blue it's so light it's just like a happy blue like if i was a little kid and somebody handed me a balloon that was this color of blue i would have been the happiest little kid uh yeah limited palette trying to reuse colors tweaking the tone of the colors and the warmth of the colors and instead of adding a bunch of new colors i'm just trying to tweak the tonality of them if I derived all of my subsequent colors from one hue and I mixed from this hue, this hue right here, then there's a, a greater consistency amongst the color scheme. 
And that's like a basic principle of color theory is to actually limit your palette and to, you know, create derivative colors from your, your core colors. So you always pick out your three primary colors and then, you know, you go from there. And I, I really like this cadmium yellow. It's very pure. I like this red. I like this blue. I picked an off yellow because it's really hard to make a good off yellow. It's just hard to make a good yellow and keep it pure. Yellow very easily turns green. And there, there is like a greenness to it, but this yellow is more brown than green. Let me see if I can get that into the light for you guys. This is a more brown than green yellow. And I find that when I am mixing my yellows, they turn out very green. And I, I just don't like that. So I, I am opting to use this one. And then this is a real sap green, but it's kind of like a, I think of it not quite as an olive green, but it could very easily become an olive green if I added blue to it. So the only time you add black to a color is if you're working with primary colors. You want to darken a primary color, you add black to it. You want to darken one of these secondary colors right here because this is kind of like a brown yellow and obviously this is green. Then you add one of the primary colors. So that's kind of why I'm not using black right now. It's because like I don't need to darken any of my primary colors. I am working with the secondary colors right now for the most part. Like everything that's blue in here, you know, that's primary color. That was the first layer I laid down. But you see everything on this top layer in here, this all this kind of like yellowy orange stuff, that was pretty much made with this right here as the first layer. And then I added cadmium red to it in certain parts to make it richer in a in a warmer sense. And then I made or in a in a brighter sense. And then I added this yellow to it to make it richer in a warmer sense. So like or how would I okay. When I think of warm and when I think of bright, let me clarify this. When I think of warm, I think of like a Gibson guitar. Like it's a deep, rich tone. And when I think of bright, I think of a Fender Strat on like its bridge pickup, right? So I guess this would be bright and this would be warm. Like adding red would make it warm, adding yellow would make it bright. That's that's the analogy I'm looking for. So my my mentality is to like kind of color pick and very carefully color pick. <coughs> Excuse me, I'm getting over a cold. That's also part of the reason why some of my work has been delayed. I've been hella sick lately. Um, horrible food poisoning over the weekend, in addition to a really bad flu that I got from one of the kids at the high school that I teach at. So, um, what else am I trying to do? Well, I'm trying to paint these mountains, and I'm trying to paint this cave. So, let's, uh, let's change the focus and get more away from the paint, and let's look at the actual painting itself. Crap, I just dropped one of my tapes. Uh, come on, buddy. Ah, oh my god, my life is a disaster. Why don't I have three arms? Okay, so getting on to the painting here. Let's adjust this a little bit. Okay. So I've kind of like moved this more towards you. As you can see, there's a bunch of green in here. That is one of the shadow zones. I am trying to outline all the shadow areas in a green because later on I will be adding blue to the green. And by adding blue to the green, it will make it um, darker. But by just outlining it with the lightest green possible, it already separates it and creates a contrast from this reddish orange. <coughs> So I am trying to create the, the contrast between light and shadow, but also between the planes of the object. Obviously, there's this line right here, this kind of harsh line right here, right? And the purpose of this harsh line is to actually be the shadow caused by the mouth of the cave. This area that's kind of splotchy right here will get lined up and, and cleaned up. But this top line right here is actually a crack in the cave. So what would happen is light would fall vertically kind of like a shaft down into here and create a line that is parallel to this one falling on the floor here. So there's actually a little white highlight here. 
So this area will get neatened up and will turn into a more uniform tone, but there'll be a little sliver of white light coming through this crack. And then you see this little circle right here? This is a tiny little dude holding a torch. This little orb right here. Sorry, I totally missed that. This little orb right here. That is a tiny little dude holding a torch. Right where the tip of my uh, paintbrush is, is his feet. And that is his head. And he is a tiny little dude. There will be a tiny little dude standing right here at the base of the bridge. And there will be a tiny little dude way over here, an even smaller one over here. So like this one is technically bigger than this one because this guy is closer to our perspective. So it's like middle, small, smallest. This one in the middle being like the closest to us being the biggest. So I, I guess actually this is the biggest, middle, tiny. So that's kind of the way I'm lining that up. And then over here, this shoreline will be the same color as this. So all of the stuff that's been kind of painted in right now is on the same planner level. Like if you were to put down a sheet of paper and you know connect from here to here, these are all on roughly the same level. These are the same height. They're just at a different point of perspective, but these are the same height, these objects. That's kind of what I'm trying to imply. These are the same height. They're just skewed away from each other. This is at the same height as this. The shoreline here is at the same height as this. And so what you're seeing is, is a, a skewed view of the hierarchy. So when I get the back shoreline painted in very soon, which will happen today, um, you'll see all the top planes basically described by this orange color. And then what my goal will be is, as you can see over here, all these harsh lines that are kind of lined up, you know, because that's what lines do, they line up. I will be continuing to describe the topography of these planes going down with these harsh lines. But what I'm going to do is go over this with my gum eraser and soften all these hard lines. And what I'm going to do is describe this side plane here with some paint. And then after there's a little bit of paint, I'm going to go over with the gum eraser and just absorb a bunch of these lines but there'll be ghosts left of the lines, these ghosts of the pencil marks. And I will use those as guides to make the rest of my decision. So these lines right here are very light, but they're kind of inaccurate. And I want to get really close to a straight line. And then if I create any deviation from the straight line, it's because like I have the straight line as a guide and the deviation is really there to just make it not look straight, but to make it look organic. So I'm going to be erasing these lines over here and I'm going to be softening them. And what's going to happen is you're going to see lines like this appear through the entire front area of this painting because all of these little crags and stuff are describing plane changes moving down this front area, which was really like the hardest thing for me to describe in the art piece which is why I took so much time to line up the perspective because I figured if the entire top plane was blocked in in perfect perspective, three point perspective, just perfectly blocked in, I could go ahead and create these little shapes, these bizarre shapes and make it super unique looking. Like the topography of this bridge is really bizarre. It's this really weird brain shape. And that was totally on purpose and like, Look at this right here. There's a bunch of spirals in here. There's all these little spirals and stuff. Like, let's take a look at that. Let's get this bad boy in there. And then let's uh, bring it in and let's repurpose it a little bit. Like, check out all these crazy spirals and stuff, right? Like, there's all these gaps. And then this is the actual true path that connects to the bridge. There's all these gaps, right? So anything that's colored in is the plane that you would walk on top of as you were crossing the bridge. That's what I want you to visualize when you look at this piece. That's why I spent all of those freaking hours going crazy, entering it into the computer and lining everything up and checking three-point perspective and ranting about Dan Seagrave and how he breaks three-point perspective and why you got to pay attention to, to <coughs> three-point perspective if you want to make anything look right. You know, it's because, like, that's the plane that people are going to walk on. 
if the plane doesn't look like it's level and flat, people are going to look at it and say, that doesn't look right. So, you know, everything in this piece looks fundamentally level because I put it all in perspective. Every single one of these things is in perspective. And that was super hard to do. And I spent a super huge amount of time doing it. But now it's paying off because while I'm doing the rendering work, I don't have to sweat it and go, oh, crap, did I actually draw that properly? Did I put that in the right place? I know that everything on these planes is correct. And the cool part is <coughs> I got to finish talking because I'm coughing now. Oh, man, I'm getting over a cold. These lines right here, I have a guide. This bottom line right here that's telling you where the frame ends, I just line a ruler up with this edge, a 90 degree straight edge, and I just go straight up into these little like descriptions that are like super detailed and complex along the topography here. Any of these little lines right here, I just line a straight edge up and draw the line straight down and through. And that's how I come up with that description. And that's how I come up with these lines. And I know that these lines here are true because the bottom is true. And I'm going to a point up here along a 90 degree axis. So I know these lines are true. And then that means that everything's going to be vertical and it's going to look super straight up and down. And that's super critical to making this whole piece in the zoomed out perspective look right. Oh, God, that's disgusting. I'm sorry you had to listen to that. So. <coughs> Oh, Jesus Christ, I'm dying. So, what's going to happen? I am going to finish describing everything in the front. I am going to finish outlining all the top planes. Once all the top planes are lined up, I am going to describe the mountains. Once the mountains are done being described, I will describe the sky. Once the sky is described, I will start messing with the clouds and the vortex. And the very last absolute least important thing to do is to mess with the tower. All right, guys, you're watching the acid drip. So thanks for uh, coming back to check the next art update. Uh, here's kind of where I'm at right now. I'm just moving some things out of the way so I can rotate this for you guys. And now what I'm working on is lining everything up uh, going horizontally, or sorry, excuse me, vertically along the bottom horizontal is what I meant to say. So if this is my straight edge, which is really useful in this case because it's clear plastic, I can line the bottom edge of it up with one of the interior marks of it, lay it across like I am, and then I can come up with the vertical streaks, which is what I've been doing to make this true vertical. So as you can see uh, right here, there's these two gaps, right? So these two white gaps, those are recessed areas. And those are going to be shadow areas. So because these areas are recessed, I'm kind of leaving them. And I'm going to try and stick to just painting the forward most planes. And you'll see a bunch of white bars in between, like kind of like jail bars. And you'll see a, a large set of those going across here. And my next goal is to finish completing, uh, or finish completing, of course, finish completing. Ugh, can't talk. My goal is to finish uh, all of the bars going across and complete this section in terms of the forward most raised area. And then those are going to be the yellow areas and reddish areas. And then the areas that are recessed are going to have a green tonality. And then later on, that green tonality will be replaced with a very dark blue purple tonality, green being the lightest color and then transitioning it into like a dark blue. So to give you an idea, this area right here is a perfect example where clearly, if I bring it in, you can see that right here, this is the shadow area because you can look along the top ridge. What that tells me is that this top ridge is the top plane. What's going on is this area right in here is recessed. And what's going on with that is it's kind of blending into the tree that I put here. There's only one tree in this entire thing that's something that Do Roger Dean would do is he would put in a tree to offset the balance of his piece. And so like I'm kind of following that theme and I am placing one tree in this piece. But I really want this area right here to stand out. And it's looking kind of like lost in here. This vertical streak 
is kind of making the rest of the green leaves from the tree disappear. So this will be more like a purple blue. And right now it looks very washed out because it's all green, but that's because this is watercolor and you start with the lightest tonality and then work backwards. So uh, the way things are gonna go on for the rest of this project is that I will be then working on the sky last. Obviously I have just left this completely colorless and that's because I actually still have a teeny bit of rendering to do. And I started painting before I had completely finished all of my rendering. I wanted to start painting because I was getting anxious about it. And I'm actually really glad that I did jump into it because um, it's helping me see things more clearly and it's helping me kind of come up with the color palette that I want to do up here. Because remember, there's two halves, the bottom half and the top half. And the land mass down here will definitely be tied in with the land mass up here. That's very much going to be the same palette. But the sky and the clouds are going to have their own palette. And then, of course, the vortex will be a part of that palette. But, and the tower will have its own palette. So there's really like three palettes going on, color palettes. And I, by having the time to, to really work on the bottom area, it's really given me like a sense of, of um, focus for what the top area will look like. And then I wanna point this out. You see this little yellow speck right here? It's pretty cool. It's this, this is the cave, the mouth of the cave. And I really took the time to make the shadow look very rich and purpley. I'll probably go over it a few more times to make it look super, super dark. Um, also, this is the back wall right here. I've been making that green. I'll be adding more and more layers of green, but the uh, stalactites that are hanging from the ceiling are like a very warm yellow orange with a small muddy green. So the yellow orange kind of contrasts the purple and um, the muddy green mutes it a little bit so it's not so bright, but you can very much see like the dimensions of the cave now, which I'm really happy about. The only thing I might have to do is add a little bit of purple to this green area to kind of further connotate the shadows so that the shadows are a little bit more uniform, right? Because it wouldn't make sense to have green shadows and purple shadows in the same area. So I will probably wash this over in purple. Um, but this little guy right here is a little man holding a torch and he's standing there and there's all this little light coming around from him and it kind of helps you recognize him because it's a little yellow spot in the middle of a big purple shadow and obviously yellow and purple contrast. So it works very well. He's got a little bright red torch. So um, by giving him the torch, you can kind of better make out like what it is this character is. I will be going in with a micron and inking him. There's actually another little tiny person right here. You can't really see him because I haven't done any work to render him. Um, finally, on the edge of this, you'll see a lot of like bright orange kind of paint. And that is gonna go along the entire top half of all the upward facing planes. What's gonna happen with that is once that's in there, um, it's gonna be very strong visual description of where the edges are. And it will keep the bridges from getting lost in this area of vertical cliffside. And I'm excited to play with that concept because instead of inking this with black ink to describe the edges, I'm just going to be rendering it with a brush, which is a lot more difficult, but it's also like better looking and I would say more professional. Um, besides that, the other big accomplishment was describing this plane more accurately. I kind of messed up when I first painted this and made this edge skewed. Now it looks like the waterfall is actually falling in the same planner direction as this one. This side sags a little bit and I am going to have to darken this edge up. So I'm gonna drop a ruler down. This side looks really true, the, the, this side being the right side. This side, the left side, looks like it sags right around here. So I'm gonna come in with a ruler and clean that up. And uh, yeah, that's, that's it so far. This is more than 20 hours into painting. I'm hoping to get this done within about 100 hours of painting. So I am roughly a quarter of the way there. Actually, I'm, I'm probably about 25 hours into this. That sounds about right. Cause I've been working on it in, in like five hour intervals. And I've had, I've actually probably put in more than 25 hours cause I've had at least three or four or five hour days. And then a lot of like little two hour days here and there. So I'm probably closer to like 30 hours into this actually. But yeah, I really wanna just slam through all of the vertical bars that are sticking out 
get those a uniform yellow, red color, orange color, then go through all the shadows and make those very green, and then go over the shadows a second time to make them kind of like purple green, or not purple green, but very dark and cool and recessed. And then I will be cleaning up a lot of my edges and just going from there. So, yep, that's the art date right now, art update right now. Um, and just, you know, got to keep trudging forward. Thanks for watching, and uh, I will see you soon.